Right now, across the USA, our LGBTQ plus community and trans people in particular are under attack. Last year was the worst year for legislative attacks against LGBTQ plus folks since 2015, according to Human Rights Campaign. In 2021, more than 290 bills targeting the LGBTQ plus community were introduced in state legislatures, and of those bills, 25 were enacted. By just the midpoint of this year, 2022 had already surpassed 2021, with 162 bills targeting LGBTQ Americans as of July 1st, and to date, 13 states have already passed anti-LGBTQ and anti-trans legislation in the USA. Anti-LGBTQ legislation has seen a massive increase since 2018, on the rise every year, with most bills targeting trans people specifically, though the scope of such laws has grown wider than ever in 2022. And now in Texas, we see Governor Greg Abbott setting a dangerous precedent by asking all licensed professionals who have direct contact with children, including doctors, nurses, and teachers, to report parents of transgender children who receive gender-affirming medical treatment for child abuse. This order was never voted on, has no real legal standing, yet several officials and agencies, including Family and Protective Services, have already said that they plan to follow it. Laws and orders like these constitute genocide, eugenics programs, the destruction of families, and extreme hazards for already at-risk trans children. As Chase Strangio of the ACLU LGBT and HIV Project said, it's important for people to pause and think about what is happening, especially in the healthcare context. Because what we're seeing is that the state should have the authority to declare a population of people so undesirable that their medical care, that they need to survive, becomes a crime. What more terrifying intrusion of the state could there be? The massive torrent of anti-LGBTQ legislation shows just how autocratic the United States of America really is, as such legislation is being forced down the throats of the people, even as support for our LGBTQ plus and trans population has been sharply rising in recent years. According to a recent Public Religion Research Institute survey, support for LGBTQ rights and policies prohibiting discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people, nearly eight in 10 Americans, or 79%, support laws that protect LGBTQ plus people from discrimination in jobs, housing, and public accommodations. Support for LGBTQ rights and policies prohibiting discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people has been steadily rising. The same survey also found that support for gay marriage has risen remarkably fast, up to 70% from just 54% in 2014. Statistics show clearly that the people of the USA are becoming increasingly tolerant, welcoming, and accepting of our non-cishet identity and love, while the tyrannical government has been trying to press draconian laws that directly contradict this will of the people. And why is this so? If more and more people are supporting our community, then why are we seeing so many laws being drafted against us? To find out, we'll have to do what we always have to do in US American politics, and follow the money. See, it's not the body politic that overwhelmingly wants to wage war against trans people. It's deep-pocketed anti-trans lobbying groups. This is not a matter of public concern, but of special interest groups who are throwing a lot of money around to get what they want. According to Human Rights Campaign, these bills come from the same forces that drove previous anti-equality fights by pushing copycat bills across state houses. Dangerous anti-LGBTQ organizations like the Heritage Foundation, Alliance Defending Freedom, designated by Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group, and Eagle Forum, among others. For example, Montana's HB 112, the first anti-transgender sports bill to be passed in 2021 through a legislative chamber in any state, was worked on by the Alliance Defending Freedom. Trans equality is popular. Anti-transgender legislation is a low priority even among Trump voters. A new PBS NPR Marist poll states that 67% of Americans, including 66% of Republicans, oppose the anti-transgender sports ban legislation proliferating across 30 states. In a 10 swing state poll conducted by the Human Rights Campaign and Heart Research Group last fall, at least 60% of Trump voters across each of the 10 swing states say transgender people should be able to live freely and openly. At least 87% of respondents across each of the 10 swing states say transgender people should have equal access to medical care, with many states breaking 90% support. 
When respondents were asked about how they prioritize the importance of banning transgender people from participation in sports as compared to other policy issues, the issue came in dead last, with between 1 and 3% prioritizing the issue. Another more recent poll conducted by the Human Rights Campaign and Heart Research Group revealed that with respect to transgender youth participation in sports, the public's strong inclination is on the side of fairness and equality for transgender student athletes. 73% of voters agree that sports are important in young people's lives. Young transgender people should be allowed opportunities to participate in a way that is safe and comfortable for them. These anti-LGBTQ laws aren't just contradictory to public opinion, they're also contradictory to science and medicine. See, many of the recent anti-trans bills that have been pushed forward are predicated on the idea that allowing trans kids to choose their gender identity is a form of child abuse, which is patently absurd. This position runs counter to every major medical study on the subject and has been refuted by every major psychological and medical institution in the USA. Children with gender dysphoria who do not receive meaningful social aid, including medical support, suffer tremendously. Alarmingly, more than half of trans boys, 42% of non-binary kids, and 30% of trans girls have attempted suicide. A 2020 study found that trans people who wanted to suppress their puberty but did not have access to medications to do so were 70% more likely to experience suicidal ideation than those who did receive puberty blockers. Proper medical care for trans kids literally saves countless thousands of lives every year. So, the idea that affirming gender identity for trans kids is somehow child abuse is flagrantly anti-science. The opposite is indeed true. Failing to affirm trans kids and support them with medical and social care is abusive and leads to a tremendous amount of self-harm and child suicide. With all this in mind, is it any wonder that the American Medical Association, American Psychological Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics all support gender-affirming care for trans kids? The scientific evidence is clear and irrefutable. Medical and social support for trans kids and affirmation of their identity is not child abuse. It saves children's lives. This has been medically proven and scientifically proven. This support is needed to stop kids from killing themselves. Anti-LGBTQ plus legislation is not popular. It is being forced on us against our will by powerful groups who have bribed their way into power through lobbying, super PACs, and all sorts of other legal but still nefarious backroom deals. This is par for the course in the USA where corruption and bribery have simply become legalized and encoded in the structure of our government. To try to understand how this kind of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation gets shoved through by special interest groups, it's worth pointing out that Abbott's executive order has been tested and shot down many times before in various other forms and communities. Basically, right-wing groups and organizations funded by deep-pocketed capitalist interests try to shove legislation through in states that don't get much attention or protection from national LGBTQ plus organizations. A great example is the state of Kansas. In Kansas, former Secretary of State Chris Kobach worked with American Legislative Exchange Council, more commonly known as ALEC, to try to push through a variety of anti-LGBTQ plus bills every year from 2012 through 2016. I should point out that ALEC was also trying to rig state and even national elections through voter ID laws and other insidious measures back in 2012, just to give you an idea of who we're dealing with here. So ALEC worked hand in glove with Kobach to try and push anti-LGBTQ plus bills through in Kansas. One such bill proposed in 2016 was particularly loathsome because on top of asking people to turn in trans kids for using bathrooms, it offered a $2,500 reward for every successful report. Abbott's executive order in Texas was also a proposed test bill in Kansas back in 2016. And from what I can tell, almost nobody has been doing any reporting on this. There's been almost no investigation of any of this. Unfortunately, the ACLU won't get involved until a law is actually passed, and other large national LGBTQ plus organizations just don't pay as much attention to so-called flyover states like Kansas. Now, I plan on trying to report on this more moving forward and signal boosting other people who are reporting on these kinds of stories, but we really need a lot more attention paid to these relationships and campaigns, especially in states that don't have as many resources for LGBTQ plus communities. Now, admittedly, this video has been a bit USA-centric, 
but it's important to realize that our struggle is international in nature. For one thing, bigots and turfs in the USA have been expending huge sums of money to export transphobia to other nations. According to information shared with the European Parliament last year, over half of funding for anti-trans actors in Europe appear to come from within Europe itself, with significant amounts of money also flowing from the US and the Russian Federation. As Raphael Glucksmann, member of the EU Parliament, said, it is intolerable for American or Russian actors to launch campaigns intended to call into question women's right to decide on what happens to their own lives and bodies. In recent history, we've seen that foreign powers use societal questions such as abortion legislation, women's rights, or the protection of minorities in Europe to impose their political agenda, and to artificially polarize our societies to a level of unrest that destabilizes our democracies. If the USA bourgeois elites are willing to spend this much money to destabilize and intervene in Europe, imagine what they're willing to do to disrupt and destabilize the global South, especially as we're entering into a multipolar world where BRICS Plus, an increasingly powerful assortment of developing economies like Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and many others, is coming into its own as a true challenge to USA hegemony around the world. LGBTQ plus people of every nation must not only recognize that our struggle is one in the same with those of LGBTQ plus people in other nations, but that the USA is very willing to export transphobia in order to disrupt and attack the political stability and economic interests of foreign nations, including even members of NATO and the European Union. This means that trans USA citizens are in many ways on the front lines of an international struggle as every strike we blow against anti-trans groups domestically will have ripple effects around the world. This also underscores the importance of understanding the intersections between imperialism and bigotry against LGBTQ plus people. Transphobia is a tool of imperialists just as imperialism is a tool of transphobes. An attack against one form of oppression will therefore weaken the other. Marsha P. Johnson once said, I'd like to see the gay revolution get started. No pride for some of us without liberation for all of us. These words ring truer than ever as not just our pride, not just our rights, but our very existence is being challenged through astroturfed, autocratic legislation and heavily funded capitalist backed media campaigns. I don't want to leave on a down note though, so let me close by pointing to an alternative vision for how our community could be treated by society. Just a couple of weeks ago, the most progressive LGBTQ plus legislation on earth was passed into law in Cuba by popular referendum. With just over two thirds of the population supporting the legislation, this is an astounding victory for LGBTQ plus people around the world and it serves as an impressive example of what's possible. Capitalist media has been describing this legislation as simply legalizing gay marriage, but Cuba's new family code goes far beyond that. Moving forward, not only will gay people have access to marriage, but trans identity will be affirmed, adoption rights will be equal for all couples regardless of sexual orientation, gender-based violence will be comprehensively addressed, domestic responsibilities will be encouraged to be shared equally and households regardless of gender. Disabled and elderly people will be granted more rights. Corporal punishment for children will be outlawed and children will be explicitly granted rights just as parents will explicitly be held responsible for raising their children in a way that is quote, respectful of the dignity and physical and mental integrity of children and adolescents. Encouraging parents to grant children more say over their lives as they mature. Now that Cuba has passed such an amazingly progressive an inclusive code into law, we know precisely what is possible. Cuba was considered a conservative nation on this subject not too long ago. LGBTQ plus activists in Cuba worked very hard for many years to build popular acceptance among the Cuban people. And judging from the referendum results, we know that a clear majority of Cubans have come to accept and respect the LGBTQ plus community, including trans people, just like in the USA, where polls show that LGBTQ plus activists in our communities have also come a long way in building up support for the LGBTQ plus community and for trans people. The key difference then is in the form of and access to democratic structures. In the USA, it's obvious that artificial astroturfed lobbying groups, which are funded and controlled by wealthy capitalists, have far more sway over the government than the people at large. That's why such draconian laws 
and executive orders are being fielded against the grain of popular opinion in the USA. We only have the illusion of democracy. Now, Cuba may not have perfect democracy, and we can argue all day over the pros and cons of the system of government in Cuba. But no matter what your position is on the Cuban government, you have to acknowledge that actual democracy was exercised here through this popular referendum, and the people's will was heard. The work which LGBTQ activists did in building acceptance among their own people was made manifest because of this legitimate democratic measure. In the USA, on the other hand, it won't be so easy because our democracy is irrefutably simply an illusion. And this is why we have to consider revolutionary tactics. Tactics like mutual aid, in which the LGBTQ community and our allies build networks of material support and aid to protect, nurture, and develop our conditions and save trans lives from the dangers of poverty, houselessness, and social stigma. And this is fundamentally different from charity, where people who have a lot give to people who have little out of the kindness of their hearts. No, we're talking about building power structures of mutual aid in which we are able to build our own networks of delivery of material needs to the places in our community where they're needed the most without having to ask for charity from a capitalist or a politician or somebody who has more power than we do. Dual power in which we build our own power institutions outside of the realm of government, corporations, and nonprofits must be built more widely. Dual power structures allow us to build power again on our own terms without being reliant on powerful outside interests. And they allow us to build social structures that suit our needs, not the needs of investors, capitalists, politicians, and other powerful entities. Secondary power, meaning we build modules of power within existing organizations, institutions, and frameworks. LGBTQ plus folks should form committees and alliances within workplaces, trade unions, political parties, and other organizations to ensure that our needs are met and our own voices are heard. Every organization in the USA and around the world should have an LGBTQ plus representative organization structure of some kind so that we can push our needs into the forum wherever we are active, wherever we exist. Direct action. Rather than working within the system, the LGBTQ plus community must continue the tradition of acting and pushing directly to pursue and protect our own interests. This can take a variety of forms from demonstrations and protests and worker strikes to applying direct pressure on institutions that mean to do us harm. This is a very powerful concept. If you're not familiar with it, I definitely recommend you do more digging on direct action. And above all, we have to get more organized, educated, and informed. Traditional organizations like Human Rights Campaign have a role to play. They've done a pretty good job of spreading the word about this new wave of legislation. I wouldn't have been able to make this video if it weren't for the resources and research and other investments that organizations like Human Rights Campaign have put out there. So I'm not downplaying the importance of these organizations. I'm just saying we need to have a whole lot more and we need to have much more radical organizations built in our communities. What the LGBTQ plus community really needs is to understand the relationship between theory and practice when it comes to building power and invoking radical change, not just working within the system. Look at the dangers of relying on the system. What is given can always be taken back. Just look at trans Starbucks workers, many of whom have been leading the charge in the recent unionizing efforts at Starbucks. A lot of trans people over the years have chosen to work at Starbucks because that company offers some health benefits that are hard to find at other similar workplaces. But now that a lot of Starbucks workers are pushing to unionize, and a lot of those people who want to unionize are trans, Starbucks is threatening trans workers specifically with withholding those vital health services that trans people rely on. The price of minimal acceptance by a corporate juggernaut like Starbucks is compliance. And what the bourgeoisie allow when it is convenient, the bourgeoisie are more than willing to take away, especially if we rise up and resist other forms of oppression. So we have to acknowledge that for many in the US and for so many under the heel of bourgeois power globally, there is no real reprieve. Only temporary gains, which can be pushed back at any moment from the capitalists wielding the real power and transformed into setbacks, as Starbucks has proven. 
Things are bad. LGBTQ plus people are becoming refugees and internally displaced persons, fleeing persecution and genocide in places that were considered relatively safe even just five years ago. And as countless trans people in the USA are now relocating to escape these horrifying laws and executive orders to seek more stability, while others are unable to stay in place for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that trans folks face staggering levels of poverty in the USA, building strong community across the nation is more important now than ever. If you are in a trans hostile community and you have to stay, then stay with the intention of finding others to build power with however you can. I have a list of organizations in some of the areas most affected by recent laws and orders in the description. And check those out if you think they'll be of help. But if you must leave, leave with the intention of joining other LGBTQ plus folks to build power with wherever you end up. We are a minority, but if we focus ourselves and our efforts geographically, then we can begin to wield local power and join forces intersectionally with other liberatory movements, and we can exert our collective power in order to help people in other places, including those who are still trapped or forced to stay behind. These media and legislative campaigns are international in scope, as I've touched on before. It's not wrong to relocate if you have the means to do so, but as long as the bourgeoisie have unchecked access to imperial power, you must realize that no place will be completely safe, not even Cuba. We know for certain that the USA is constantly trying to intervene in places like Cuba and trying to destabilize society there. I mean, just, just look at how many times USA state organizations like USAID have been caught overtly trying to destabilize and disrupt and intervene in Cuba and other Caribbean and Latin American nations. And just as deep-pocketed anti-trans lobbying groups from the USA have funded anti-LGBTQ plus campaigns in Europe and the UK, there's every reason to think that these same organizations will be fighting to turn back the historical victory that is the new Cuban Family Code. So I mean it when I say, none of us are free until all of us are free. As people who have gone through the journey of coming out and grappling with our own identities in ways that come with risk, danger, and uncertainty, we are uniquely positioned to fight this kind of revolution. As individuals, we have proven ourselves to be brave and resilient. The key is that we must embrace collectivism in our struggle. We must become a new people and build something new. My fellow LGBTQ plus people in the so-called USA, reform and protest are not enough. Politeness and working within the system are clearly not enough, especially since this system is so dangerously and radically rigged to oppose our existence as human beings. The system doesn't care about the voices of the people. The system forces draconian and murderous laws on us in spite of the will of the people. The rights of LGBTQ plus people across America have never been and will never be developed through requesting nor even demanding rights. Our only recourse is to seize power through revolutionary direct action, dual power, mutual aid, and above all, organizing. Now, I won't pretend to know the specific forms of organization and fighting that must be done. That's going to vary wildly from one community to the next, you know your material conditions much better than I do. But I do know that the fight has just begun, and equality will never be handed to us by the corrupt, autocratic, and undemocratic state, which is the USA. And once trans power has been built, once non-binary power has been built, once power has been seized by our LGBTQ plus community, no institution will be able to attack us at the stroke of a legislative pen ever again. As Rosa Luxemburg wrote, it is contrary to history to represent work for reforms as a long drawn out revolution and revolution as a condensed series of reforms. A social transformation and a legislative reform do not differ according to their duration, but according to their content. The secret of historic change through the utilization of political power resides precisely in the transformation of simple quantitative modification into a new quality, or to speak more concretely, in the passage of an historic period from one given form of society to another. I know times are tough right now. I know a lot of you are probably scared and hurting. I'm very worried myself. I'm worried for all of my friends and comrades back in the USA. But I know that if we stand together and fight together, we will seize trans power, gay power, LGBTQ plus power. We deserve it. 
Let's go take it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more about trans identity from an indigenous perspective, check out Tale of Twin Rabbits video, A Queer Native Thanksgiving. There's a link in the description. I also have a video that goes into more detail about revolutionary organizing tactics and strategies. And I have a video where I explain my journey to discovering that I'm non-binary. So I'll put links to those in the description as well. And finally, if you're a socialist or a communist or an anarchist and you are not LGBTQ+, and you're not quite sure how the LGBTQ plus struggle has anything to do with class struggle, I highly recommend you check out my partner Luna's article on the subject. There's a link to that in the description as well. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe. Please take care of each other.